Salutations, my friends, I'm the Mighty Mandarin. Hey, it's been a little bit of a hiatus, but we're back on the channel. And uh, before I throw myself into the world of games that are so shitty that uh, they might possibly make me reevaluate my entire existence, I wanted to start this new era of reviews off with a game that I actually really, really like. But first, um, as a 21-year-old college student who is currently in school and has very little disposable income as a result, I have to pick and choose the new games that I get each year very, very carefully. And uh, sometimes they end up being a total miss, like last year's infamously overhyped and overmarketed and underproduced and generally just a pretty bad game, No Man's Sky, which I actually liked for a little bit. I had some fun with that game, but it did turn out to be a massive disappointment in the end. And sometimes they end up being Overwatch, which I played pretty much constantly all of last summer, and uh, I still go back and play pretty regularly every once in a while. So today I'm going to be talking about another game that I picked up last year during the summer of 2016. Not exactly when it was brand new, but pretty close. But before we get into it, I wanted to give you guys a little bit of a refresher just on the history of the, the recent history of the first person shooter genre. Sometime around the turn of the seventh console generation, the first-person shooter genre went through something of a renaissance. It had been around in various forms since Wolfenstein 3D, maybe even before then in concept, but the first-person shooter genre really started going through a golden era shortly after the turn of the millennium, and there was really one game that was really chiefly responsible for that, Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare. With how much of a revelation this game was when it came out in 2007, it basically served as a blueprint not only for every Call of Duty game from that point on, but pretty much every traditional first person shooter outright took some sort of influence from Modern Warfare. Eventually, this massive influx of similarly styled and controlling shooters led to some major genre fatigue among the gaming community. One can only take so much Hollywood military jargon and washed out shades of grey color palettes before it gets tedious and depressing as hell, you know? Naturally, while the major players in the industry were riding this wave of macho madness all the way to its breaking point, there were also some entries in the genre that sought to break those traditions and establish their own unique identities while simultaneously breathing some new life into the genre. Yet stuff like Borderlands, Portal, Mirror's Edge, Bulletstorm, Metro, and the subject of today's video, the reboot of id Software's classic franchise, the one that originally popularized the genre with its fast-paced gameplay and over-the-top gory demonized action, Mother Dude. Developed by id Software, the same company that basically created the genre with Wolfenstein 3D all those years ago, and published by Bethesda, Doom was one of my favorite games of 2016, and was generally well received by both critics and audiences for its fast-paced gameplay, intense action, badass metal-inspired soundtrack, and more. However, the prospects weren't always so good for id's reboot of its classic franchise. After the release of the multiplayer beta for Doom, but before the launch of the game, players were slamming it online, bleeding on about, This isn't Doom! This isn't old school! This is made for consoles! It's just another Call of Duty clone! Well, guess what? F*** you! This game's awesome! Now allow me to explain why. Okay, so to be fair, maybe releasing a multiplayer beta instead of a single player demo, maybe, you know, showing off the first level, wasn't the best call. The multiplayer, while perfectly passable, doesn't really represent the best of what this game has to offer. It would have been pretty hard for this game to divert from the new standard FPS multiplayer format of the Call of Duties and the so ons, you know, with your weapon loadouts instead of your arena pickups, classes and customization instead of unique characters, etc., without inadvertently stepping on the toes of id's upcoming multiplayer shooter, Quake Champions. But the naysayers ate their words when the game was released because the amazing single player campaign on its own is well worth the price of admission. In this game you play as the Doom Marine, also known as the Doom Slayer or simply Doom Guy, who apparently is the same unnamed super soldier that you played as in the original Doom. And there is a widely accepted theory that even though he's unnamed, he is actually a descendant of BJ Blazkowicz from the Wolfenstein games. Man, I'm not sure if I would love or hate to be a guest at that family's Thanksgiving dinner. Probably serve massive amounts of all-American apple pie and roasted mancubus carved with a chainsaw or something. Ugh. Prior to the events of this game, the demons actually detained the Doom Marine and put him into some sort of stasis because no matter how hard they tried, they just couldn't manage to kill the guy. This one man struck such fear into the hearts of the denizens of hell that they had no choice but to imprison him because they physically could not kill him. 
In any event, this is where the new Doom kicks off. You awake as the Doom Marine to find yourself in a scientific complex on Mars completely overrun by demons, and you get right back to doing what you do best, which is killing these demons in an incredibly violent and brutal fashion with an assortment of both primitive and advanced weaponry. And that can be the end of the exposition for some people. If you came here just to kill demons, then you can get right to it, ignore everything else that's going on, go where you're told, and you'll likely walk away completely satisfied because the combat and gameplay progression alone is likely enough to keep any FPS fan interested. The movement is fast and fluid, the frame rate on PS4 never dips below 60, and the weapons are each unique and satisfying to use for different reasons, and they, along with your combat suit and basic stats, you know, health, armor, and ammo capacity, can all be upgraded at intervals throughout the game, and that sense of personal progression is one of this game's best assets. The story itself is linear and simplistic, with any real meaty details and backstory being hidden in the background. All completely optional, but all very interesting should you choose to explore it. Information about every character, enemy, and location can be found in the database, and there's a lot of cool visual storytelling moments interspersed during the lulls in the action. The theming is primarily based around corporate greed, and yet again, the dangers of mankind thinking it's indestructible and exploiting forces beyond its control. The extent of the consequences of that in this game is almost comical. The corporation in this instance, the UAC, literally hijacked the resources of hell itself in order to create a sustainable energy source, like... Just step back and think about that for a second. It is f***ing insane. The head of the UAC, Samuel Hayden, who is actually a robot man, sort of corrals you along to do his bidding because he needs you in order to regain control of his facility, and your only purpose and desire is to kill demons and not die, both of which retaking the facility and closing the portal between the dimensions will theoretically allow you to do. And man, is the Doom Marine f***ing insanely proficient at killing demons. Throughout the game, you'll gain access to eight different primary weapons, pistol, two shotguns, assault rifles, chain guns, rocket launchers, Gauss cannons, and more. There's also a couple special weapons, like the insta-kill chainsaw that consumes a different number of fuel units depending on the size of the enemy you kill, and drops a surplus of ammo when used, and in the later stages of the game you unlock the BFG, which famously stands for Big F***ing Gun. Basically, it kills everything on the screen, saves your ass in a pinch. It's lovely. Love using the BFG. You gain access to these weapons by finding them as the game progresses, and you can apply different upgrades to them by finding Field Drones, one of this game's many collectibles scattered throughout the levels. Each upgrade heavily modifies the way in which your weapon is fired. You can make your shotgun shoot grenades, your assault rifle shoot mini rockets, or turn your chain gun into a mobile turret to burn through ammo and tear your enemies to shreds in seconds, just to name a few. And there's this game's glory kill system, which is brilliant in its own right. When an enemy is at low health, they start glowing, and if you hit them with a melee attack while they're glowing, you can perform a glory kill, a brutal hand-to-hand -hand melee execution which is incredibly satisfying. And not only is it satisfying, it's a vital mechanic for survival in this game. Glory kills drop a higher amount of health, which you need to pick up because health does not regenerate in this game. So in order to stay alive, you have to move rapidly and play aggressively. There's a real sense of balance to the way these pickups are dispensed in this game. If you're active in the way you play this game and you use glory kills when you need health and the chainsaw when you need ammo, pick up the occasional quad damage or speed boost power up at the right time to use it for maximum effectiveness, this game in turn is incredibly rewarding and satisfying. Each level in this game is brilliantly designed. Naturally, they increase in difficulty as the game goes on. There are some levels on Mars and some in the actual dimension of hell, but all of them basically follow the same design principles. Let's use one of my personal favorite levels, the Foundry, as an example. Your objective is simple. Stop the meltdown. Your primary objective in each level is always just a short, simple job to keep you on task. Again, no overly complex plot getting in the way of demon killing. Eliminating enemies and taking out these gore nests lifts the lockdown on specific areas, along with finding specific color-coded key cards or skulls, one yellow, one blue, all of which allow you to progress further in the level and complete specific objectives. I remember playing through this game the first time during the summer of 2016, and it took me until this level to really get into the groove of this game. I was really confused by the wide open maps and very intimidated by the sense of speed, but once I got to the foundry late one night after work, it all really just clicked for me. I really enveloped myself in the thick, almost palpable sci-fi horror atmosphere of it, really started enjoying the minute-to-minute -minute gameplay, the individual combat interactions, not worrying about getting lost, but enjoying the exploration. And while this is by no means an exploration-based game, it still rewards those who venture off the beaten path. 
each level is massive, complex, and chock full of secrets to find and upgrades to collect, which is good, because it more than makes up for the relatively small number of levels the game has. I think there's 12 in total. You've got the previously mentioned field drones, Argent cells, which you can use to upgrade your health, armor, or ammo capacity. You can find hidden weapons like the plasma rifle or super shotgun and get access to them earlier than you would when you come across them naturally. Dead elite guards with chips that you can use to upgrade your Praetor suit to do anything from climb ledges and switch weapons faster, to making secrets visible on the map and light up the compass when in close proximity to one. You can also find these little Doom Guy statues, which are mostly there as collectibles, but also give you weapon upgrade points and models of weapons and characters to look at back at the level selection screen. And finally, you've got the most elusive collectibles in the game, the lever in each level which you have to pull, which hide in plain sight, and when pulled, opens up a room nearby which looks like the entryway to a classic Doom level. When you enter this room, you unlock a full classic Doom map that you can access from the selection menu and then play through. Such an awesome thing to include. It's great bonus content and it shows an appreciation for the roots of the franchise on the developer's part, which only reinforces the notion that so much dedication and care went into making this game. And that dedication and care went into every aspect of this game, not only in the level design. So back when this game first came out, Jim Sterling did an episode of his editorial series The Jimquisition singing the praises of one specific aspect of this game in particular the player character. I won't go into as much detail here as he did for obvious reasons, but the gist of it is this. Using only first person character animations, Doom Guy is one of the most fleshed out silent protagonists in the history of gaming and an incredibly entertaining character as a result. Whereas other protagonists in this situation would follow orders unequivocally and bend to the will of the powers that be without question, you can tell that Doom Guy opts to do his own thing instead. And this is mostly due to his colorful first person animations. You want to give him an ultimatum? Fine, I'll do what you want, but I'm not going to like it. And f this computer screen. My objective is to disable the Argent energy filters without destroying them? F you and your corporate greed, I'm going to smash it with my foot. Need an employee handprint to open a door? There's a dead guy, I'm going to take his f***ing arm. I print, I'm going to take his entire f***ing torso and carry it with me in my inventory because I'm a badass. I'm also going to fist bump this little action figure because it looks like me and I'm awesome. Everything he does perfectly fits into the game, perfectly represents this game's brash, aggressive, sometimes over the top, gory and disgusting stylization. And it's another example of character and personality being injected into this game where it wasn't strictly necessary, but the game is all the better for it. Let me explain what I consider to be one of the best early examples of this. Right at the end of the introductory chapter, Samuel Hayden says to you that the disaster at the facility leading to the overrunning of it by demons and the deaths of all the UAC employees was for the betterment of mankind and that it was the cost of progress. Just as he says this, the Doom Marine looks down at the mutilated remains of one of the employees, back at the terminal through which Samuel Hayden is talking to you, cracks his knuckles, winds up, and punches the screen. Title drop. Without a word, Doomguy says, The cost of progress? Tens of thousands of people getting butchered by demons is what your dumb calculating robot ass thinks is the betterment of humanity? Was it worth it? Let me answer that for you. F no. Each animation and cutscene perfectly exemplifies how little of a f this guy gives, and I love him for it. He is one of my favorite playable characters in a first-person shooter since Gordon Freeman, and Gordon didn't even have any built-in characterization. It was all on the player to do it for him. So to sum it up, given the initial backlash this game faced when the beta was released, it's better than it has any right to be. It's exactly the shot of adrenaline that the first person shooter genre needs every once in a while to renew the gaming community's faith in it. It's fast, intense, ingeniously designed, masterfully executed, beautifully balanced, and fun. All of it adds up to just pure, unabashed, unapologetic, disgusting gaming fun. And that's why it's one of my favorite games of 2016 and one of my favorite first person shooters of all time. All right, so obviously there are a lot of things I like about this game, but what are three things in particular that stand out to me? Well, the first is probably the weapons. The weapons are sort of the backbone of the entire gameplay of this game, and uh, they're each unique and fun to use for their own reasons. My personal favorite, my personal favorites rather, are probably the uh, super shotgun and the chain gun. Those guns are just so much fun to use. Um, and you can throw in an honorable mention to the combat shotgun for being like one of the best starter weapons that I've ever used in a first person shooter. Um, next, I really like the boss fights. The boss fights are really unique and interesting. There's only three of them and they only appear in the back half of the game, but they're just a really, really good uh, use of all this game's mechanics of the, the, the fast paced uh, running and shooting and, and all that. It's, it's just the boss fights are really cool. You got the cyber demon, the hell guards, 
and the final boss fight against the spider mastermind they're all they're all really cool for their own different reasons and um, I really like the soundtrack like the soundtrack is one of the things that is um sort of like one of the best features of this game the techno metal style of it really just fits into the atmosphere really really well and the intensity of the music just um, it, it cues in at exactly the right moment and just really heightens the experience. Um, some games like this use the music to really like dial you into the action and Doom is just fantastic at doing this. Not only is it a perfect example of this, it might actually just be the new benchmark because it's so effective at dialing you in with the action. And you know what, throw in an honorable mention to Doom Guy. I f***ing love Doom Guy. He's such a great protagonist and he's so like, so understated but just so over the top and crazy and just he doesn't give a f it's great so let me know what you guys think do you did do you guys think that id software successfully revitalized their franchise with this new entry in the doom series or do you think they failed do you guys think this game will stand the test of time or do you think it will fade into relative obscurity like its uh previous entry doom 3 did about 13 years ago let me know what you guys think in the comments below as always i've been the mighty mander and i'll catch you guys next time peace out my friends Hey guys, couple more things before I go. First, I have a bunch of Mighty Mander videos planned for the channel over the next couple of months, so make sure you subscribe if you haven't yet, and hit the notification button up top so you'll know when those new videos go up. I'm really excited about these videos, and I think I finally found my groove on the channel in terms of the type of content that I want to create. Also, during the hiatus, my good friend Dimitri Ashby and I say, what's up, Dimitri? Yo, yo, yo. We started a new channel called Aqua Society Gaming. So if you want more consistent content uploads from yours truly, go check that out. We got Let's Plays, Gameplay Montages, the Aqua Society Gaming Podcast, and more all over there on ASG. So go ahead and check that out if you wish. Also, make sure to check me out on Instagram if you so choose. Check out Truth the Equalizer on Instagram right here. Yeah. And feel free to check out my Best of Mander playlist if you want to see some of my personal favorite videos I've made on the channel over the past couple years. I look forward to seeing you all in the next video, and I thank each and every one of you very much for watching. I'll see you all next time.